Welcome to the Strategic Treasurer Podcast, your source for interesting treasury news in your car, at the gym, or wherever you decide to tune in. NGOs, or non-governmental organizations, operate globally and often in a wide variety of countries. This position involves a significant level of complexity, and that complexity significantly impacts treasury. Dealing with remote banks, various KYC requirements, and a wide range of financial regulations can create a unique set of challenges. On this episode of the podcast, Strategic Treasurer's Craig Jeffrey interviews Stephen Zalby of Care International. Listen in as they explore a number of challenges that NGO treasury groups are forced to address. Welcome to this edition of the Treasury Update Podcast. I'm Craig Jeffrey with Strategic Treasure. I'm joined in our offices in Atlanta with Steve Zabi, who's the Director of Global Treasury Services at CARE. Glad to have you here, Steve. Thank you so much. It's I'm glad to be here. CARE is a non-government organization or NGO. Can you tell us a little bit about what CARE does and its footprint across the globe? I think that'll be interesting. Uh, right. So CARE is a humanitarian organization. We uh, provide assistance to uh, distressed peoples and disaster relief. Uh, also, a lot of development work, which uh, uh, really, I think, is a growing area for us throughout all the regions that uh, where we have a presence. And you know, we don't do any work or humanitarian assistance in the U.S. It's all international and primarily Africa, Asia, the Middle East, um, Latin America. We've got 40 business units um, in, in those regions. So 40 business units primarily in non-Western regions and countries of the world. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. There's, I think there's a lot that can be learned, whether the, the listener is coming from a nonprofit or non-government organization. Uh, they could be in the corporate world or somewhere else where there's different elements that could be learned in this discussion. But I, I wanted to hear a little bit more about your background in treasure. I think everybody could benefit from because you've worked at airlines, uh, et cetera. Why don't you just describe some of the places you've worked at? Started off my treasury career with Delta Airlines and uh, a number of years ago, and then uh, was four years with Delta and then uh, four years with uh, a company called Home Depot. So I went from a $15 billion company to a $70 billion company and uh, then had the opportunity to go to what was then a, kind of a startup, Novellus, you know, uh, the aluminum manufacturer, and uh, all in the context of treasury. And then, um, you know, came over uh, to CARE. And, you know, one thing that amazes me about CARE, we're a $500 million uh, NGO. So, you know, obviously minuscule relative to the corporates I've been with. But dollar for dollar, you know, because of the footprint globally and the different environments we deal with, I would say dollar for dollar, it's the most complex organization I've ever been with. Uh, from a treasury standpoint. Now, now, complexity comes in different ways. It could be how much you're investing. It could be uh, countries you're in, payment types, volume of activity, et cetera. So is it, uh, what's what's the key area of complexity? Right. So think about uh, if you have a great idea that is good for the organization and there's no dispute, whether it's a you know particular financial control or a system that you want to implement, and, you know, this is good for the organization worldwide to do this. And it's your job to implement that, to oversee it, uh, you know, in terms of uh, getting it out to the, uh, to the different business units. You're dealing with different cultures and languages and people with different skill sets. And managing that uh, is where I think the complexity comes in. You've got that aspect of it, but then also you've got these bank relationships now Okay. Yeah, before we jump into the bank relationships, just talking about that rolling out to different people. So many large corporations, the ones that you've worked with before, if they have treasury operations across the globe, they tend to be in pretty big centers. Most of the treasury finance people speak English uh, or you know, it could be a second language, but are usually pretty competent in that. Is that very different in your situation here? Well, uh, most of the folks, and it, and it really obviously depends on the country, but a lot of the uh, business units, um, English is not the first language. Also, because we're working in a lot of developing countries, we're dealing with individuals who uh, have different educational levels and, and experience. So if we're implementing something that's relatively complex, you know, for example, our ERP, People's Financials, uh, the challenges are certainly there. 
in, in addition to the, the people challenges and maybe the fact that they don't, uh, English might be the third or fourth language they have, what, what are the challenges you find from a banking perspective? As far as the banks that we deal with, uh, we run the gamut. You know, we, we deal with some of the largest multinational banks uh, on the planet, of course. But then there are pockets, there are regions in these developing countries where, uh, you know, there are banks that, uh, frankly, I had never heard of before. And I call them mom and pop shop banks. They may be swift connected or they may not be. And in some locations uh, where there's no bank, then it's incumbent on us to, uh, to create a safe cash account. And that's, that creates a whole new set of challenges because you know, that center, that, that missional center uh, that might be in a very remote location still requires cash to uh, pay staff and so forth, to pay vendors. But from a banking standpoint, we're trying to integrate our accounts, for example, and we can get into that perhaps uh, a little bit later, but uh, we want connectivity with um, uh, our banking partners. There are so many banks uh, that we um, deal with that just don't have that capability. Such a small area, remote, um, very informal. Oh, yeah, yeah. In fact, you know, we talk about, you know, MT101s, uh, you know, uh, a SWIFT payment uh, file format or, um, you know, the MT940s, which is the SWIFT bank activity files. And some of the banking partners that we deal with have never even heard of them. And so we have to educate them and see if there's any chance that they can accommodate us. But definitely those are uh, some of the challenges that we've got going on. Sure. What What are the, some of the other elements that, that you face with everything being in a hard-to-reach area? Well, so getting cash certainly to um, uh, some of the places where we've got these, you know, safe cash accounts. And I think most NGOs like CARE have the same challenge. We rely on what are known as hawalas, or I like to call them money mules. You can't just call up the armored carrier and have them transport half a million dollars or whatever to, uh, to this remote location. So that takes on a new level of, I guess, challenge or, or risk uh, in and of itself. You know, in some of the remote locations also, ensuring proper financial controls, depending on who is there uh, to manage uh, that location, because if we're talking about a very remote location in Congo or Uganda or wherever, chances are there's not going to be a lot of staff. And yet the expectation is that uh, those that manage that bank account will do so in a way that's compliant with our, uh, our control policies. There's the challenge of getting the money to these locations. You also think about in the U.S., there's a lot of checks that go on. When you're looking at these locations, it's probably not electronic when you're paying staff or moving areas. Maybe it's not even check. Is there, is, are these heavy cash economies as well? Yeah, and I, I've been surprised to find out uh, since I've been with CARE that they still rely a lot um, on checks. But our goal is to really go paperless as much as possible to electronify our, um, our payment method. Let's, uh, let's explore some of the challenges that you and I have talked about in the past. One is getting cash visibility in a timely manner, seeing where that is. There's the challenge of getting funds to these different areas and different banks, yeah. uh, whether they're multinational banks or, or very large ones or they're very small. How are you finding that as a problem? And, and what, are, what are you doing and what have you done to reduce that, that opaqueness? Care, I think, like a lot of NGOs, uh, kind of grew organically over the years. And that's to say that in, in many of the countries, the local mission grew uh, or evolved over the years, almost independent of any centralized uh, you know, control or strategy. When I came on board, there was a lot of, um, say, large cash balances in different accounts throughout the world. And I would say idle balances. Um, a lot of the donors that funded projects among our business units, they would fund uh, the local accounts directly. And uh, sometimes, you know, if the project didn't start immediately, the funds would sit there for some time. And that not only, you know, introduces uh, opportunity costs because it's an idle balance, let's say, but also other risk, uh, you know, associated with devaluation of a currency, if it happens to be a local currency or something like that. And so what I did um, is 
we established uh, myself along with our CFO and uh, you know obviously other folks within the organization that, that supported this effort is to centralize our cash and uh, create a policy that really mandated donor organizations to send cash flows into concentration accounts, multi-currency concentration accounts, obviously dollars, but also uh, for European donors, whether it's uh, uh, pounds, euro, or Swiss francs, let's say. In that way, uh, it gives us the opportunity to then ensure the value, to retain the value, and perhaps uh, you know see uh, uh, interest income uh, from those balances, but also fund you know those business units based on their needs. It enhanced organizational liquidity as well, rather than having these these pockets uh, throughout the world centralizing cash, and that has worked well for us, I think, over the years. So yeah, that's the the collection method, and then you you can distribute it as needed. But you certainly, I think, want to see where the cash is globally, see it being drawn down, and, and I imagine you have some ways of seeing that through the banking structure and through your financial statements. Is how 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 does that work at at Care? So uh, a couple of years ago, uh, we launched an effort to integrate our bank account structure with our ERP again, PeopleSoft Financials. And by integrate, I mean uh, establish through a SWIFT service bureau connectivity to each um, of our bank accounts. Again, the challenge was that we have a lot of bank relationships that are very small. And those banks may not have the capacity um, at this point to, uh, to support this initiative. But those that do, we've been able to integrate over 100 accounts. And there's some of our larger accounts that send bank activity files daily. And those are uploaded then into PeopleSoft. And so we can run a query and at a glance get, at least for those accounts, you know, the balances. That has really helped us, uh, you know, keep our hand on the pulse of where the cash is going. And so in that effort to integrate those accounts, and we've got over 200 accounts right now worldwide, we continue to strive to integrate those. For those that aren't integrated, we have to rely on either bank statements being sent monthly. Physical bank statements? Correct. And in some cases, there might be online bank portals and communication from our business units to our shared services center, which CARE has in Manila, uh, Philippines. And uh, our colleagues in Manila then will key enter that data or run a program that can actually extract some of the information from Excel or from a PDF file. Uh, how long have you had this visibility to about half of your bank accounts? Obviously, the, the largest amount sums are you're pulling in from those. but Yeah, initially, um, you know, it was the HQ accounts here in the U.S. that we integrated first. But uh, in terms of the business units, we started with the largest banks because they had the IT expertise to, you know, support, uh, to expedite the integrations. And so I'd say uh, this started about four years ago and has been slowly but surely building up. I'd say we're about 110 to 120 of our accounts. Invisibility, excellent. Before we talk about communication across the globe, you'd mentioned some challenges there. I know that criminals are not uh, selective in who they go after. They go after everyone, including NGOs, nonprofits, banks, large corporates, small corporates. I mean, there's no honor among thieves. They'll go after everyone. What are some of the attacks and challenges that hit you, just like every other NGO? That I know you talk a lot in these groups with other uh, treasury, uh, senior treasury folks at, at, at non-government organizations and nonprofits. What are some of the big things you're seeing in these different attacks? Right. Uh, so the, certainly the, the BEC or the business email compromise or the phishing attacks, the spoofing where you receive a, uh, an email and uh, the email address that comes in looks as if it's uh, an internal communication from an executive, but that's just a gloss. Uh, you know, it, it really originates from outside the organization. And we've seen that for a, a few years. What I can tell you is that more recently, the sophistication of those emails is uh, scary. Um, they, uh, the emails look so authentic that, uh, you know, one's sometimes compelled to just take it at face value and say, well, this, you know, this must be legit. In that case, there's an effort to educate uh, everyone in the organization. Of course, our IT folks, um, you know, lead that effort, but um, to make sure that everyone is um, privy, uh, you know, to these different attempts. And, you know, Craig, I agree with you that that these kinds of scams 
uh, hit every uh, organization, uh, large, small, and, and those in between. From what I understand, that uh, there is a, uh, let's say, a bias towards some of the smaller organizations because the sense among these uh, hackers is that smaller organizations don't have the sophistication of cybersecurity to the same level as the larger organizations. You know, whether that's true or not, but uh, that's uh, that's the sense I'm getting. And, you know, I think some of the smaller NGOs um, probably fit into that category. Yeah, I think with the, the automated attacks on organizations, uh, you know, if they're targeting a particular organization, they may do that. Uh, but I think in their broad sweeps that they're doing, uh, their level and sophistication of the attack may overwhelm a small organization that doesn't have seven layers of defense, it only has three. So they get past that. And therefore, they realize a higher rate of return on small organizations, whether it's intentional or not. Who knows? We don't have stats on that, but it's it's very prolific and it's automated. So there's there's a definite uh, issue there. Let's uh, let's talk about compliance. You know, you think about the challenges of some of the large organizations you worked worked at, complying with know your customer requirements across the globe. Very very challenging. You have the same challenges with the know your customer as well as all of the sanctioned entities. And you deal in so many countries where there might be perhaps even more sanctioned parties or hard, uh, it might be harder to identify those. How do you go about ensuring you're complying across the board with these types of situations for, for payments, for example? I can't speak for you know the corporate side, but I can tell you that from the NGO side, uh, we live and die with compliance. You know, we have a very robust uh, compliance structure. For example, with our PeopleSoft Financials, we have um, a direct link with um, Bridger, and Bridger is an organization that pulls uh, data uh, from several sources. Uh, so, for example, whenever we set up a vendor, a new vendor in the system, that vendor is reviewed through Bridger by you know, several different sources to, uh, to see if there's anything in the background or any, if it's flagged in any way uh, from a compliance standpoint, you know, and it's not just vendors, but uh, even donors and so forth, um, you know, a certain level of, uh, of, of donor, there's a lot of compliance. And then, of course, you know, the whole uh, OFAC uh, issue, part of our mission is in uh, North Sudan, you know, Syria and so forth. Uh, what's interesting is that, you um, you know, recently the State Department has has lifted uh, OFAC requirements. This is actually, I believe, a, a year or two ago for humanitarian organizations that operate in North Sudan. But still, uh, oftentimes our payments get flagged if it even contains the word Syria. And uh, forever, we might just tell the banks repeatedly, we're a humanitarian organization and we're not required to have an OFAC license based on the State Department or the, you know, I, I forget what organization might be the uh, the compliance regulator in that regard. But still, I know the bank's compliance units will continue to flag payments. And there was a time uh, a couple of years ago when this became very much a risk uh, for CARE. We had a lot of delayed payments where the, the funds were not reaching our sub-grantees and it was inhibiting progress with um, our programs. And think about that from a humanitarian crisis standpoint. People aren't getting paid and the mission grounds to a halt. Well, you've got people li people's lives in the balance. And uh, we really had to reach out to our banks and in fact uh, engaged uh, some of our executives uh, you know, to assist us with this, to just underscore uh, you know, the importance of timely payment you know, if we dot the I's, we cross the T's, everything is in compliance, we submit the payment, then we'd like to see that go through. Now, I get that banks have a firewall with their compliance units. They don't want any outside influence or anything like that. They have to perform their job, you know, object objectively and so forth. Um, and yet, if they, if they continue vetting the same vendor repeatedly because it contains the word Syria, that is something that I struggle to grasp, uh, why that would be continue to be an issue. Yeah, so operating these different regions that are 
subject to scrutiny and holding up payments has a, a major impact. And, uh, you know, solving those is what else are you doing to solve that? Well, so I, I can tell you that recently, uh, you know, our payments are moving much more smoothly. So I think that uh, it seems, knock on wood, that uh, we've gotten over some of the major hurdles related to timely settlement of our payments uh, to vendors in those areas. You know, the other challenge that we face is, and you mentioned the KYC, the Know Your Customer issue with our banks. And uh, it seems like some of our banking partners have uh, taken a deeper dive uh, with uh you know, wanting to know what CARE, uh, you know, is up to, not just CARE, but um, but a lot of the NGOs, but the nuances and some of the really, I, I would say, onerous questions. Now, they're just doing their job and they need to know, based on their own criteria, everything that we're involved in and so forth. Um, I get that. But uh, a few years ago, and I won't name the bank, but we actually had a banking partner that wanted to know when we started assisting Syrian refugees, they wanted to know the names and addresses of those refugees. Now, now think about that. At a uh, refugee camp? <laughs> refugee, refugee camp, camp. 10, 12. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, we actually got that request. I took it to our general counsel, and that just didn't fly uh, because that would be impossible. So... You know, that's just an example of sometimes uh, maybe how how banks really are. This is a sensitive issue for banks, I think. You know, we're familiar with headline risk. You know, if they inadvertently they they honor a payment to an entity that they uh, thought was legit, and this turns out to be uh, to have ties with some kind of nefarious organization, and then they find their name on the front page of of the Wall Street Journal. So, um, yeah, they want to avoid risks like that. But there's got to be a happy medium. Now, in terms of your treasury organization, there's central treasury here in the U.S. You have a bunch of people who do finance functions, maybe payments. They don't They don't report into the treasury group here. They're just, what, finance all over the, all over the globe, regionally managed or locally managed? Yeah, that's right. Um, locally managed. And yet the treasury function here um, in the U.S., uh, supports the business unit. So we have our policies that we uh, disseminate. You know, I mentioned, for example, the that donors uh, should route funds to concentration accounts so that we can support liquidity. Uh, that would be one. We also have, you know, um, other policies that are supported by uh, our business units, but also training, especially with financial controls. Because a lot of these folks in these business units don't have the same access to resources that we do. And so there's that uh, a very important education uh, aspect to uh, our involvement with them. So let's, uh, let's explore that just uh, a little bit. The concept of you need to roll out some change in a process or explain some new control or train people on here are some new methods of attack by cyber thieves or by others who are trying to defraud your organization. How do you go about making sure that that's communicated well, consistently and over time, as opposed to a single one-time event? Well, we have, we have uh, different venues or different um, forums, I, I suppose, of communication. Certainly there's email, <laughs> but there's also on the other end of the spectrum, passive ways of, of learning. Uh, you know, we promote our Treasury SharePoint site, which all of our business units have access to. And we post articles, but also updates, uh, you know, with uh, uh, cybersecurity issues. So that's, that sounds like a better way of distributing or disseminating information where they go to a known safe site at CARE. They can click on those links versus if you send an email click on this link to learn about phishing attacks. Well, maybe that is a phishing attack. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're like, exactly. hey, protect yourself against this, and, uh, you know, you run into a challenge there. Right. Uh, we just, you know, one of the challenges with that, though, is um, to make sure that people are going out and, um, and seeing the updates. Um, and we have to make sure that we've got all the languages covered uh, as well. Uh, the other issue, uh, as far as that goes, the other challenge is that, some of the locations don't have great bandwidth. They might access the, uh, the site or attempt to access the site, 
and uh, it might download after <clears throat> excuse me after half an hour. <laughs> so um, so there's that aspect of it too. But then aside from those the two that I mentioned, we also conduct WebExes things like that also to uh, to make sure that uh, our folks are getting um, you know are well informed. Steve, let me let me ask you a question. I, a little more broader than more broadly than care alone. I know you talk to a lot of. NGO treasury people, you, you guys have regular meetings where you discuss some of the challenges that are uh, either unique to NGOs or are also broader challenges and you, f- you figure out ways to solve those. What are some of the big challenges you've seen out there at other organizations? Don't name them, of course. It's going to be a lot of the uh, issues that I just mentioned, the communication aspect of it, uh, the financial controls, the dissemination of information, and the security also. I think that those are all uh, hot button issues, uh, and not just for CARE, but uh, a lot of our uh, peer organizations, the visibility to cash. You know, those are things that think, uh, you know, we all, challenges that we all face. So let's go through some uh, fraud examples you've heard about. One of the uh, recent attempts, and again, this is, this has to do with a, a business email compromise that, you know, from what I understand, uh, an individual had their uh, email compromised and uh, it was actually taken over because this, this organization at the time, at least, did not have multi-factor authentication. So the person that was with the organization had their email taken over. And apparently there was a level of knowledge by the hacker uh, as to the, the routine, uh, the pro- protocol now they they may have gone through the uh, the emails and have seen uh, they watched uh, for a long time watched yeah. for a long time they could they could look at the emails and see what was going on and what they did was actually send a wire transfer form to the organization's bank now this organization from what I understand was using online banking to send wires they had been doing that for several months before they were doing that. They were using this, you know, emailing these wire forms, but the wire forms themselves were password protected and they could only be sent by the country director. And uh, this country director was the only one apparently that had the password, at least with the organization. And then on the bank side, you know, there were probably a handful of operational folks that had the key or the password to open it up and to affect the transfer based on the contents of the form. The hacker, the person that uh, you know, gained access to the, uh, to the email, they gained access to an individual who was not the country director, uh, but just a, let's say a, say a finance manager perhaps, and sent a form that was not password protected and put in the body of the email something to the effect of, well, you know, this uh, vendor is not in our online banking and we're having difficulty with them, would you please process this? Now, based on previous protocol, you would think that the bank would say, well, that's ridiculous. You know, we're not do that. It's not, number one, it's not from the country director. We don't recognize, you know, your authority to affect this, uh, to send us this form. And secondly, it's not password protected. Lo and behold, the bank affected the transfer based on that. The starting point was their email being compromised and being taken over by a fraudster. But the sophistication level, and you mentioned that they were just watching a long time. So apparently a lot of these folks are just very patient. They see what the operation is like, what protocols are in place. Really, it's up to the bank then, hopefully, uh, you know, to, to uh, prevent the affecting of a fraudulent wire. Requested by email, right? Yeah. <laughs> I guess that uh, there's a lot, a uh, lot to unpack in that in terms of, uh, in terms of challenges. Steve, I want to thank you for spending some time this afternoon, going through some of the challenges you face, some of the challenges that may be more unique to NGOs, and supporting the mission of of care across the globe. We really appreciate the work you do, and uh, your time today. Uh, absolutely, thank you, Craig. I appreciate uh, the invitation. You've reached the end of another episode of the Treasury Update podcast. To receive Treasury insights and helpful resources, sign up for our newsletter at strategictreasurer.com.